Mitchell. I'm a proposal development coordinator in the Office of Proposal Development. Um, I'm actually new here at FSU. I've been here for two months. Prior to that, I was a policy analyst and program manager at the Florida Office of Energy responsible for alternative fuel vehicles. Um, while there, I successfully applied for and received funding for $17 million worth of projects from the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Department of Energy. Um, and I'm going to talk today about 10, th oh, my PowerPoint is not up. What am I doing? Got ahead of myself. I'm sorry. Um, 10 things to know about the NSF career proposal. Uh, so one of the dangers of going last in a uh, conference or a workshop is that most of what I have to present to you has already been talked about either by NSF, Ross, or our panel. Um, so think of these as the, the minimum things that you need to know. If you don't uh, take anything else away from this workshop, take these 10 things because if you don't do them, your chances of success are very low. So number one, remember that career is about you. Uh, unlike other NSF programs, this focuses um, on you as a PI, not just on your research. Uh, so this first paragraph here is verbatim from the program solicitation. The National Science Foundation's most prestigious award in support of junior faculty who exemplify the role of teacher scholars through outstanding research, excellent education, and the integration of research and education. Such activities should build a firm foundation for a lifetime of leadership in integrating education and research. So that's a very formal and government way of saying the focus of the grant is on you. Um, you really need to think about how is this award going to set you up for a lifetime of contributions to your field and not just on producing a research project like in other NSF proposals. Um, as you write the proposal too, you really need to think on how to sell the idea that you are among the most promising junior faculty in your field. Uh, number two, another thing that we've already kind of talked about, but remember to integrate the research and education components. Like I said, NSF Career supports teacher scholars. Uh, you need to think of yourself as both, and as you write your career development plan, remember that part of your career is going to be teaching. Um, this is not the place to neglect the education component. Don't give a, a canned answer or a generic plan that doesn't offer any specifics about what you're going to do and just really generically says something like, I'm going to work with students. Um, also, really think about how will you measure the impact and the success of that educational component. So this is a good and a bad example of how to do that. So the good example. The dynamical robots used in this study will also be used as a part of a new program called Robots and Rovers Getting a Leg Up to connect the robotics community in the Tallahassee area. This program will connect university students both in person and through online social networks to members of the local maker community, to high school participants in the first program, and to students in over a dozen local middle and elementary schools. So this is good. This is specific. It has what you're going to do, you're going to have a program. You named the program. That Naming it alone is much better than just saying, we'll go out and we'll do good things. It shows that you've put some thought into it. You've invested a little bit of time and effort into uh, coming up with how you're going to do this. Um, it also talks about over a dozen local middle and elementary schools. Um, by naming the number, it shows that you've really thought about which ones you're going to go to and you've identified uh, or potentially identified people at those schools to work with. It would be better if you could name them um, specifically and say, I have worked with Principal Smith at Leon County High School and I will do this. But this is otherwise this is a really good uh, statement. <coughs> Contrast that with the bad statement down here, the PI will work with students at a local high school to describe the results of the research. That's not very good. What does, what does will work with mean? We see that a lot in proposals and if it's not specified what you're going to do, it really means almost nothing. Um, because it could mean anything. Um, it, also, it leaves a lot of room for doubt, and it kind of sounds like an afterthought, and that's not what you want out of your education plan. You have a question? Yeah. So I could imagine writing one of these things where you kind of separate your research and education. Would it be crazy to attempt to write about them both at the same time? No, actually, that's, that's a very clear way of saying what I'm supposed to be saying here. Um, it's Oh, uh, would it be crazy to integrate the research and education, essentially, in, in, in the proposal? 
No, that's, that's actually a good idea. And that's, there are two schools of thought when it comes to integrating it. It's either you can do it that way and you can talk about them together at the same time throughout the proposal, or you can, you can write your research plan and then write your education plan, but in the education plan refer back to specifically the research components. And also think about how, how will the results of the research impact how you conduct your education components. Is that? Uh, so number three, work with your senior faculty mentor. Uh, they are perhaps the most qualified person on campus to help you write this proposal. So as our panelists said, work with your colleagues also. Work with someone in your field so that you do have the, uh, the scientific knowledge because the, the people in, in Office of Proposal Development and Sponsored Research, we can help you write, we can help edit, we can read for grammar, flow, consistency, uh, make sure you're staying on message, but we don't have the scientific knowledge that your colleagues and your senior faculty mentor have. Um, they're also very much invested in your success. They want to see you get this award, and um, likely they have prior NSF experience, which can be a really valuable tool. They know how the process works. They know what reviewers are looking for. They've either been a reviewer themselves. They've had proposals reviewed, um, and it can really, help you as you write to have somebody with that kind of expertise in your corner. Uh, so number four, be smart. Some of you may have heard of this concept of, of smart metrics before. Smart stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. Uh, it's, it's a way of thinking about both the proposal as a whole and the goals within the proposal. So specific. Uh, be specific, you know, let them know what you're talking about. Be clear and focused and avoid misinterpretation. Measurable, try to quantify it in some way. Um, attainable, make sure that what you're proposing to do, you can actually do, both with the, the available time and the, uh, the available budget. One of the most common things that I have uh, seen proposals be returned for is because uh, it says the reviewers felt that the, the proposer was trying to do too much with too little. They didn't have either enough money in their budget or uh, had proposed things that would take them 10 years to do instead of five. Uh, relevant, as scientists, you all are most likely familiar with the idea of measuring relevant things, not measuring things that just have no, nothing to do with your, your research. Um, and also in the context of the overall career proposal, make sure that what you are doing fits with NSF's goals, FSU's goals, and your own career and research goals. And then timely, make sure that the work is doable within the project period. So this is another example. Um, as you mentioned too, this example and the previous one both come from successful FSU career proposals. In fact, the first one I think might have come from Dr. Clark's. Um, and these proposals are available on OPD's website um, for anyone to come in and look at. Um, so just take a second here, just read this by yourself, it's kind of long, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so is it, is it smart? Yes. So it's specific. It talks about, it has four bullets here of specifically what they're going to do. They're going to examine the nature of mathematics teachers, uh, opportunities to learn, examine how work contexts influence, uh, examine, they've, they've spelled out exactly what they're going to do. Uh, is it measurable? Yes, there are numbers up there. 1,047 mathematics teachers, 35,304 students. Those are, uh, those could easily be turned into data points that could be analyzed by another researcher or another, um, or it could be analyzed by another researcher. Um, is it attainable? Yes, that seems like a, a realistic thing that you could do um, in five years. Uh, evaluate 1,047 mathematics teachers at 201 middle schools. It'd be a different thing if you said you were going to uh, conduct a global survey of 100,000 mathematics teachers and a million students. That's, that's too far. Um, is it relevant? 
yes, it fits with what the uh, the overall goal of this NSF directorate would be, um, and also I, I assume fits in with what the individual researchers' career goals are. Uh, and is it timely? Yes. In fact, it mentions specifically here over four years, giving a time frame for the work to be done. So again, contrast that with this bad example. The project will examine middle and high school teachers to see how they learn, what influences they're teaching, and will use the results to help them be better at their jobs. So is it specific? No, not really. Middle and high school teachers is about the most specific that it gets. Uh, is it measurable? There's no real quantifiable elements within this statement. Is it achievable? Maybe, probably, because it didn't give enough specifics to be able to tell. Um, is it relevant? Again, maybe. And is it timely? Maybe. There's a lot of room for interpretation and a lot of room for doubt in this. Uh, and it's not going to make a reviewer feel very confident about funding this proposal. So number five, we have talked about at length with just about everybody who's been on the screen or on the stage, uh, contact your NSF program officer. NSF expects that you're going to do this. Uh, unlike some other funding agencies out there, it is not illegal, frowned upon, anything like that. Just please make sure that you do it the right way. So as we've heard from the program officers at NSF and our, our panelists here, one page, email. The one thing I do want to elaborate on or just really drive home is be specific. Don't just send a my name is Dr. So-and-so at FSU, here is my research, and leave it at that. Make sure that you're actually asking something, um, and make it clear what you're asking too. Uh, so here is, here is my research, my question is, does this fit within your directorate's goal, mission? Um, and if not, do you have a recommendation for where it might go? Also, don't, like I said, don't cold call them out of nowhere, and don't pester them. If they don't get back to you in a day, don't call them again. Don't call them again two days later. Um, give them a little bit of time to think about your research and uh, formulate a response. Uh, number six is really big. Know the review criteria. So this came directly out of the program solicitation, and I'm not going to read it verbatim, but it's, it's very important to go find the solicitation, read through it, read through the review criteria. Uh, and think about that as you write, because otherwise you're just writing for the sake of writing. If you don't know how reviewers are going to look at your proposal, what elements are they going to judge it based on, it's a lot harder to give them the information they need to be able to make the decision that they need to. Um, so in addition to these review criteria here, the reviewers must also consider the departmental letter, the data management plan, and the postdoc mentoring plan. Um, None of these three things will make your proposal, but they will break them. If you do a poor job in the data management plan, it doesn't matter how good your research proposal is, you will get, at the very least, knocked for it. Um, you can have the best plan out there, but if you say that you're going to store your, um, store your data in a shoebox in your closet and only share it with your closest friends and family, well, that's not, that's not acceptable, and it will break your proposal. Um, same thing with the postdoc mentoring plan, although not, not quite as much. And I should mention for the data management plan, um, there's a really good resource in the Office of Digital Research and Scholarship by the name of Renane Julian. He's in Strozier Library. He will essentially write a data management plan for you if you contact him. Um, and if you get in touch with uh, myself, Beth, or Kate, we can put you in contact with him directly. Um, and then also, this is kind of a 6A type thing. Um, Make sure that a reviewer can answer these things, if, if nothing else. So who are you and what do you want to do? And also, in addition to making sure the reviewer can answer these, make sure that you can answer these before you start writing. Um, who are you and what do you want to do? Why do you want to do it and why should we care? That one's really important because, uh, like the panelists said, everybody on your review panel is not going to be a subject matter expert. They're going to be somebody who is scientifically literate but not, not in your field. And you're going to need to convince them that what you are doing is important and that they should care about it and that they should fund it. Um, how will you do it? Have a, a solid plan for how you're going to, your research and your education components are going to unfold. Um, how will you know if you are successful? Uh, that goes back to the SMART metrics that we talked about. Um, 
be specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely in judging how you are successful. Uh, what benefits will accrue if you are successful? That's your, your broader impacts statement. And then finally, are you qualified and do you have the resources necessary to be successful? No, they'll be available on OPD's website there after this. As will the, the video. Am I, am I going too fast? Is that? Oh, no. <laughs> um, number seven, follow the required proposal format. Uh, and this really should say, follow the required proposal format exactly. Do not deviate from it at all because you will be returned without review. Um, the NSF career program is governed by the grant proposal guide and NSF program solicitation 15-555. The program solicitation takes precedence over the GPG if there are any conflicts. Um, as we mentioned, there was a new GPG that was released in January 2016. The summary of significant changes was put out by NSF uh, to describe what is different between the previous version and this new version, and that is available on OPD's website as well. Um, the big change, like we kind of talked about, was the moving of the uh, conflicts of interest out of the biosketch and into its own separate document. That's a a pretty significant change that most people were previously familiar with, and then also the use of URLs within the body of the project description or project summary. Um, so this goes along with that last slide as well. This is a kind of an overview of a career proposal, um, and it's just it's helpful to look at this and envision that this is this is everything that goes into it. Most people, when they think about it, are going to think about the project description right there, the 15 pages, the, the meat of what you're going to write. Um, but you do need to realize that there are all these other things that have to go in there that, again, if you don't do, you will not have a, a successful um, proposal. Um, and number eight, if you are rejected. Um, the reality is that there is a good chance that you will be rejected. Um, however, remember that you have three attempts, and many proposals were not funded on the first or even second attempt. Out of the panelists up here, I think one said they were funded on the first attempt, one was funded on his third attempt. Um, really remember why you're doing this. Remember the motivation for it in the first place. This is secure funding for five years. This is the most prestigious award by the National Science Foundation, one of, if not the most prestigious uh, federally funding agencies. Um, and it, it will go a long way in your effort to achieve tenure. Um, so, after you receive your rejection, read your comments. It's completely natural to be disappointed, upset. Um, if you're not, you probably aren't doing this for the right reasons. Um, I would say read your comments. This is something that I do too when I, I have been rejected in the past. Read your comments, get upset, get disappointed, come back a week later and read your comments again after you've, you've settled down. Um, when you do, focus on recurring themes and not individual comments. Like uh, Dr. Clark said, if one person didn't like your proposal but everybody else did, their comment probably is not, not reflective of the overall evaluation. Um, and then think about what you can change. Is there a way to address the panel's concerns? Is it easily addressable? Does it require you to radically alter everything you've done? Um, and then finally, get to work on next year's. The sooner you do, the, you know, the easier it'll be when it comes time to submit. And you have all that lead time to, again, go back and ask your senior faculty mentor, ask OPD, ask sponsored research, uh, get, in get in touch with the, um, the NSF program officer and ask any questions that you might have. Um, number nine, this is a very straightforward slide. If you do any of these things, you are not going to be funded. If you have any co-PIs or senior personnel, you will not be funded. If you provide a letter of support, not a letter of collaboration, but a letter of support, a letter of endorsement, you will not be funded. NSF does not want those. If you do have a collaborator, uh, you need to have the letter of collaboration follow the very specific format that is in the program solicitation. Um, and there was a bit of, con I think, confusion when we were talking about that earlier. That, that statement says something to the effect of, my name is so-and-so, and if Dr whoever is funded, I intend to collaborate with them. And that is all that it says. There is nothing about, he's a great guy, his research is awesome. And no, it's, it's literally one sentence. Um, do not include any appendices. NSF does not allow that. 
don't duplicate another NSF award or proposal. Um, and that's important too, if you have proposed this work but it has not been funded, don't, you can't propose the same thing for career. Uh, don't use URLs in the project summary or description. Don't deviate from the solicitation or GPG. And also, please don't start writing your proposal in July with it being due on July 20th. That, that's not going to work. Um, and so along that line, this is just a suggestion of how you should plan the next few months to do this. So today, decide if you're going to apply for career this year. I think most people in this room have already made that decision. Um, I might add to this, let your department chair know, let your senior faculty mentor know um, that you intend to do this. Next week, uh, finalize your idea and write the one page briefing on you and your proposed topic and decide what directorate you think you're going to apply for. Sometime in March, contact the NSF program officer over that directorate and ask those questions that we talked about. Um, by the beginning of May, have a first draft of the project description, the 15 page uh, meat of the proposal. Ask a senior faculty mentor if you haven't already uh, to review it and also ask OPD and sponsored research to review. Um, beginning in June, start assembling the required documents, the departmental letter, your budget, your letters of collaboration, your bio sketch. Um, by the beginning of July, that's about the time that you want to have a, a final draft ready to go. Uh, in preparation for July 14th, the date that we are recommending that you get your proposal to sponsored research and ask them to submit in the next couple of days. Um, so the July 14th date is a little bit different than the normal three working day policy that sponsored research has. That's because many of you are coming from the same departments and we don't want to overwhelm your sponsored research officer. Um, because it will, it will be much better if they are not looking at 20 proposals if they're looking at two or three and can really focus on them and give you good feedback. Um, and then you can also, you can continue to edit and work on the project summary and the project description up until the NSF deadline. But the other documents, the budget and the, uh, all the other components need to be finalized by July 14th. And then July 20th to July 23rd are the dates that the proposals are due to NSF. Each directorate has its own due date, uh, which is listed on the front of the um, program solicitation. So that's it. I am Mike Mitchell. There's my contact information. Feel free to give me a call or email anytime. I can help literally as soon as you want with this. Um, and think of me as kind of an all-purpose consultant for, for whatever you need. So, thanks.